All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. And I think it, you know, it's an especially busy end of year proposal season this year. At least that's our experience. And no doubt many of the listeners are kind of addressing the challenges of listening in while they're working on proposals and taking the challenges of uh, their mobile research to the next level. So um, I'd like to give everyone a little bit of a break from the methodology that the um, others, um, other speakers have uh, focused on and help you think a little bit about future planning as well and um, spend my time telling you where I see mobile mar market research moving, maybe not you know, in, in the next six months or the next year, but down the road. So something that you don't have to address immediately. Um, my, my view of uh, mobile, uh, mobile segmentation within the market research industry is continually being redefined. So I'm, I'm going to share that view first. I'd, I'd like to look across the mobile landscape and set a little background to the discussion before I move on. So I see um, really about five segments that I think of, and the very first one always being where we started, which was in um, traditional online um, the, with the unintentional mobile respondent where we have a project that may not be mobile enabled or mobile friendly or mobile optimized, whatever wording we want to give around that. And, and you know, we see a lot of focus on an agreement that there needs to be greater consideration of this respondent pool. It's broadening out to the entire online respondent pool, as, as Annie emphasized, with many companies just continuing to ignore the implications you know, ignore that, uh, especially on, on those uh, hard to change trackers. But in addition, we have the segment of the intentional mobile respondent, and this could be in surveys, communities, or pretty much any type of project. And, you know, whether it's an app approach or a browser approach, there are an increasing number of projects in our industry that require a mobile device for that what we call in the moment research, um, in the moment research where we're targeting mobile only respondents. And some segment of that, I, I move it to its own segment, is the location and event based triggers um, where you generally are needing to utilize or the, the project is best implemented with an app approach. And then there's another segment um, which is which I consider call passive metering. Um, it's mo mobile enabled passive data collection. It may not be exclusively mobile. Um, again, some of it implemented via dedicated apps or, or uh, some data now collected by wearables, um, third-party apps that actually do something else. There's a wide array of that type of data now. And then the fifth segment I think of as micro polls. I'm going to be focusing on this area quite a bit in my talk. Um, and it's um, a component of, of the beaconing and wearables. and and favorable for a lot of uh, approaches where the app is act actually has some other intention and you're not really recruiting the response. So as you can see from this landscape in the chart, um, all but the purple are really natural migration points for mobile, my by which I mean you don't have any choice but to look outside of what we've considered the mainstream set of solutions that our industry has offered. To the, to the mobile world. Um, the, the industry has seen what I guess some people would call resistance to mobile in the first segment, uh, the unintentional mobile respondents. I think for a variety of reasons. Some of it is budgetary or resource constraints, um, the trackers that won't track if you start including mobile, um, the, the utilization of you know, your, your solution set that wasn't designed to support mobile or supports that differently than your other traditional online segments. 
but it goes without saying as an industry we need to begin thinking of mobile as traditional online. So today half of our traffic at Kinesis is generated by people using mobile devices. Um, we're, we're highly focused upon um, helping our clients build online panels today. And what we experience there is that between 15% to 25% of double opt-in panelists are being recruited via mobile devices, depending on the type of panel, uh, unless somebody does something to just deliberately exclude them from that opt-in process. And so what this means is that that um, for approximately 20% of the people in your online panels, the very first touch point that they encounter with our, uh, with our industry or with the, at least with that research panel that they're joining at the time is on their mobile device. So getting back to some of, uh, you know, some of what Annie was talking about, if anyone has expectations around the quality of online panels, but um, use, relies upon them and doesn't plan and test for mobile within their projects, and I'm, I'm sure you see the disconnect. One in, one in five of the panelists was probably recruited via a mobile channel and chose to use their mobile device, so they're expecting a, a commensurate experience, or they're just likely to disengage from, from that panel. Maybe they'll join another one, but they'll probably use the mo their mobile device again. So we're in this ecosystem now that can really only thrive unless we're all stewards of it, and we need to be more careful stewards. But that's not really where I wanted to focus my discussion. Um, I'm, I'm really wanting to focus on the other non-purple, <laughs> from the previous slides, non-traditional segments. I think there's a lot of excitement there and where the game changes for us as an industry. So for 2015, we're seeing the discussions being um, far less, I think, about the traditional online segment um, that I highlighted and much more about those other four segments where additional investment would typically be required. So the discussion still continues into, into best practices and those, um, there's no, there's a lot of work left to be done there, but in these other segments, mobile surveys are less about the market research ecosphere and more about what's happening in the mobile industry, marketing and advertising, retail, in apps in general, and in the overall technology realms that are happening around us. And, and um, making what we do possible. And that's what makes it so exciting for our industry and somewhat intimidating because uh, some of the newer solutions can be game changers and they're more a part about being involved in a, in a much bigger um, world than what we're in right now. So mobile and along with the social media, big data, um, predictive analytics is opening up our, our industry to research and data collection models that are more dynamic and complex in their, in their underlying business nature, I think. Um, the business models are changing and the touch points that we're accustomed to um, are starting to be replaced by some more auto, automated processes. And I'll speak about this more in just a minute. And so now on to a few predictions for our industry's mobile future. And um, prediction number one is on retail beaconing. Um, I think retail beaconing will become the next area of major experimentation in market research. Um, ironically, most people in our industry think of beacons differently or haven't heard of um, beacons. They tend to view them as a means of online ad tracking and that's a good um, place to start with your thinking. The reason I'm fo focusing on this prediction first is that it's always wise I think for market research to track what's going on in the advertising industry and in advertising beacons are the next big thing. 
So for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of beacons, I'm going to provide an analogy. The, the beacon, which is something that takes place in the retail environment, is to the physical world what the cookie is for online content and commerce. Basically, it's providing a means of, um, of, cap, of utilizing location in a different and much more localized way than geolocation services that we have come to think about in our industry, you know, geofencing and geotracking, all of it within the retail and, very, and, and small physical shopping environments. And I, I think it's actually going to become more important to us um, than the way we thought of it before, of geolocation before. So here's a bit more about how it works. A small Bluetooth-enabled device, or generally you would use a, a many devices, are installed within the retail environment. A customer with an app, and this could be an app such as Shop, Shopkick, which I would suggest everyone try, or a retailer's app such as you know, Target, um, a third-party app, or we can even envision Apple and Google getting into the space with their own um, offerings. Um, the app op interacts with the beacon to communicate with the shopper as they maneuver through a store. So the communications to the shoppers might include you know, promotions, uh, rewards for checking out new products, sort of like you can imagine a, a new product scavenger hunt, something that directs traffic through the store and is even a, a type of gamification. Um, additional information about products that are, are, that are on display. And from our industry standpoint, we're always wanting to capture customer feedback. And this could be a way to, in a single click, um, capture the experience feedback that Jeffrey was talking about. We see beaconing as a tremendous augment for customer satisfaction, but in the balance, it's also a test of how intrusive we're willing to let promotional messaging become, and that's the cautionary tale. I think many of us remember the quote, the media is the message, but it's really carried much further now in that the media is the store, um, and the store is the media. Um, Cross-media marketing carries new weight as online tracking emerges with, merges with the physical location, and the retailers in all of this process are losing some control over what happens in the physical environment, so this is a way for them to regain some of that. Moving on to prediction number two, um, which is around apps versus browsers. I predicted, I think it was four or five years ago, that the app approach to surveys would not survive in our industry and that the browser-based approach would win out. And of course, we've seen tremendous use of apps in our industry, but for the most part, I want to say that that prediction is still holding up simply because of the tremendous um, cost differential in maintaining apps um, for many types of projects and um, it, much more expensive than a browser-based approach. And so I'd like to modify that prediction, revisit it, and say that the app is, has become the solution of last resort, especially as we know it in our industry. There's times when the app is needed, but most researchers are learning that browsers um, offer many advantages over the app in most situations. And this is not to say that I'm not in love with apps. I am. There just hasn't been any financial benefit to, um, the, to most of the investors of the pure you know, survey-based type app in our industry. So, um, you know, the app has, has issues around uh, ongoing development and maintenance, and uh, I, I won't go through all the, the advantages and disadvantages. They're on the screen, and you can um, visit them even after they're available on the, the uh, website. 
but we're seeing many firms abandoning their apps now in favor of utilization of third-party apps that they can white label. Again, because of expense, it's more expensive to recruit to app-based projects and then you have the underlying developments as well. So apps are, are proving much more cost effective when the expense is shared by white labeling and respondents are also, I think, seeing an ex um, a getting more and more accustomed to se seeking an experience that's relatively stable from situation to situation. So the more they encounter a common user interface, the better for the respondent. So I do believe that the survey-based apps will mostly disappear and that their functionality um, will be integrated into apps that do much, much more. Um, these may be in-client apps, think brand apps or third-party apps, but most won't have too much to do with the market research industry per se. Prediction number three, um, mobile respondents will be given greater control over the communications that they wish to receive, and that's all part of the movement towards customizable experiences. Precise indoor location sensing combined with mobile apps, um, not, I'm not talking about market research apps here, will enable a new generation of extremely personalized services and information that's tailored to the what, when, and where people wish to see it. We already see our mobile devices doing this today as they in scroll important notices to us, even when our devices are you know, maybe in lockdown mode. Since mobile devices are already the preferred mode of receiving communications of all types, this, I think, has broad implications for how we communicate with research respondents when we're requesting information. So I think that the traditional online market research will be increasingly moved to the non-urgent and junk or noise realm. Um, again, a, a good reason to listen to what Annie had to say. Prediction number four, um, the value proposition in MR is changing, and I think we all know that it needs to. Whether you want to um, blame it, I don't know if blame is the right word here, um, on an overly competitive or undifferentiated market research industry, the ease and necessity of, of uh, do-it-yourself research, uh, the ease of use of those tools, and, and the desire of in-clients to take control, or some other reason, the margins in the research industry have shrunk all they can reach, and, and yet the in-clients still um, are expected to deliver more each year with their budgets. So we're relying more and more on technology and content to do the work for us and people to kind of step out of the way, um, which again means that we'll be further meshed with the overall mobile and technology ecosystem, which it frankly is absorbing us anyway. And, and the question is what this means for us. It's, to me, increasingly will be the content vendors and the technology vendors that, that have the leg up in data collection. Um, respondents may pay for devices and personal data, and in many cases, those, that, that data and those devices may be their own reward. So it can be the, might be the communities themselves, and I'm, I'm using the term community in a broader sense than we might use it in our industry that are going to become increasingly important in compensating research participants, whether they're active participants or passive, in the passive participants and don't even know their data is being shared, um, or when data is just a byproduct of other things. Um, so the content is increasingly becoming the reward and the device the reward. And maybe, uh, maybe Maybe some of us will be able to turn this on our heads, their heads a little bit, and, and you pay a little bit uh, more. Uh, I can see potentially models where respondents, um, you know, may, may pay to join communities for the value of the that, that those communities have to offer. Um, 
this is one reason that I, I think some of the revenue models will be flipped in favor of the technology vendor. And if you think back to the beaconing example of Shopkick, the app, that Shopkick app, if you go try it, generates rewards that can be used for thing, product discounts and, and other things in exchange for the data that collects. And I, I mean, I'd just like to offer an analogy here, which is taxi cabs. I have had a couple of I will say very negative taxicab experiences lately, um, and as a result, you know, um, have uh, utilized Uber. And if you think about cabs, they failed to innovate, and um, Uber actually is doing a very good job in many areas of supplanting the taxicab industry. Um, there are potentially things that could supplant Uber. We all know about the concept of driverless cars, um, which is um, a similar in an app-based approach, but that's, that's the way I sort of think in, of this in an out-of-the-industry um, way. Prediction number five. Hi, Leslie. Uh-huh. Just to say we're running a little short of time, so if we can move through quite quickly, that'd be super. Okay, I'm almost there. Um, the user experience becomes paramount. The amount of usability testing that goes into apps and websites is setting new standards for what the end user experience, and again, think respondent here, should be. The expectations are only going to increase. And the consistency of presentation from experience to experience, as well as the inner entertainment value are going to be increasingly important to retain subscribers. And last prediction, no surprises here, wearables are our next platform. The smartphone is becoming the hub of a personal area network which will consist of wearable gadgets, uh, smartwatches, jewelry, things like that. And look for these to play a very important role in the beaconing that I brought up in the, in the first um, prediction. So um, jumping to the end, mobile is no longer about that tracker and those projects that don't yet support mobile respondents. That problem is there. There's a lot of research on research to be done. We still have to have a lot of clients and projects that we need to bring into that fold. But um, just as marketing and advertisers are focusing on creating the right experiences, we as researchers need to do the same. And sometimes that means taking an evolutionary leap, um, not simply um, changing the parameters of the project that we're in. So um, I, I, I invite everyone to think about this um, from a step back that is about creating a better experience, one that's not necessarily how the world has done it before, and maybe one that the research participant is a much subtler part of.